I'm Kent Garrett. Welcome to another edition of the Kent Garrett Podcast. Coming up on this edition, guess who is the lone voice on the right regarding Israel? And Palestinians try to get through to the mainstream media. Caitlin Johnstone says that the U.S. is just as culpable as Israel for the atrocities committed in Gaza. No decent person can watch the video of young people being murdered at a music festival in southern Israel without feeling horrified. It's awful, and there's no excusing it. No matter what you think of Israel's policies in Gaza, you are not allowed to shoot people at music festivals. That's a crime. Israel has a right to respond to that crime and to defend itself. No one seriously contests that. The question for American policymakers, however, is what do we do next? How do we represent the interests of the United States in this chaotic moment? That's not a selfish question. It's the whole point of making policy for a country to improve and protect that country. If you serve in the U.S. Congress or in the executive branch of government, you have a moral duty to think this way. It's your job. You serve the United States and its population. You have no moral authority except to the extent that you represent your fellow Americans. That's our system. It used to be obvious, but it's worth remembering now because the conflict between Israel and Hamas could escalate into a war between Iran and its allies and the West. Once a war like that starts, you could easily imagine the use of nuclear weapons and all that entails. Millions dead, the collapse of the global economy. At the very least, you could see an unprecedented energy crisis here. Already gas in one Bay Area service station hit $7.29 a gallon over the weekend. If that trend worsens and persists, the United States, which is already, technically speaking, bankrupt, would plunge into depression. And no, it would not be like the 1930s. Close to 10 million people have come here over the last three years from the poorest places in the world. The overwhelming majority of them are on some form of federal subsidies. You wonder how that's going to work out when the U.S. government runs out of money. So there's a lot at stake in how we encourage Israel to respond to the horrifying Hamas attacks. Wisdom and long-term thinking are essential, but you will not be surprised to learn that is not what we are getting. Watch this person, for example, who happens to be the media's pick for president of the United States. This is not just an attack on Israel. This is an attack on America because they hate us just as much. And what we have to understand is this is the reason that we have to unite around making sure our enemies do not hurt our friends. America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends, just like we needed them on 9-11. That's why Ukraine needs us when Russia's doing this. That's why Israel needs us when Hamas and Iran are doing this. And I'll say this to, to Prime Minister Netanyahu, finish them. Finish them. Hamas did this. You know Iran's behind it. Finish them. They should have hell to pay for what they've just done. This was an attack on America, she says, when in fact it was not. And for that reason, we must, quote, finish Iran, a nation of nearly 90 million people. What are we watching here? This is not sober leadership. She's a child, and this is the tantrum of a child. Ignorant, cocksure, bloodthirsty. Yet no one in Washington scolded her for it. In fact, they aped her hysteria. Here's fellow neocon Lindsey Graham just spelling it out and calling for the bombing of Iran. So I've been on the phone all day to the Mideast, and I've told our allies and people with connections to Iran, what I would do, I would tell Iran that if Hezbollah attacks Israel, we're going to come after you, the Iranians, and have a coordinated effort between the United States and Israel to put Iran out of the oil business by destroying their refineries. There are four major refineries in Iran. They're fixed targets. Uh, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, I would make Iran pay a heavy price. What exactly would happen to the United States if we declared war on Iran and started blowing up their infrastructure? Lindsey Graham has no clue what would happen. He hasn't thought it through. He's almost 70 years old and he has no children. He doesn't care. But neither, amazingly, do most of his colleagues in Washington. They're as reckless as he is. Texas Congressman Dan Crenshaw took to social media to call for what he described as a war to end all wars, as if there is such a thing. But of course, there isn't such a thing. Wars beget more war. The bigger the conflict, the uglier and longer lasting the consequences. See World War I for details. 
These are not complex observations, but they seem lost on our leadership class. Alone among candidates running for the Republican nomination for president, Vivek Ramaswamy dared to suggest that actually going to war with Iran might not be in America's national interest. And for saying that, Mike Pence immediately denounced him as gutless and unpatriotic or something. But we thought it might be worth hearing more. Vivek Ramaswamy joins us now. Vivek, thanks so much for coming on. So if I'm reading this correctly, you suggested while offering what seemed like real sympathy um, to the Israeli people, and to the many murdered there two days ago, uh, you noted that maybe it's not in America's best long-term interest to declare war on Iran. Is that what you said? I actually said this long before this crisis when people were thinking clear-headedly. And I just want to say a couple of things that are obvious but important, Tucker. I mean, what happened against Israel? You said it. I believe it. It is barbaric. It is medieval. Yeah. It is wrong. And Israel as a nation absolutely has the right to self-defense, to its own national existence. And I think of they course. should have our moral and diplomatic support as an ally. But there's one element of this that nobody's talking about. What the hell went wrong with U.S. and Israeli intelligence and the Israeli defense that allowed this to happen? Everybody seems to be punting that as a question for later. I think it's a question for now, if you're Israel. I mean, look, I think that Nikki Haley, I disagree with you a little bit there. I don't think she's a child. I think that she is somebody who is, like many politicians, in a position to get wealthier from war. Look at the military contracting business and otherwise. But put that to Fair. one side. The message that I would send would be very different. Get to the bottom of what allowed this gaping hole of intelligence and defense to even happen before feeding that same beast. If a doctor told you his job was to keep you from getting cancer and then you got that cancer, don't go trust that same doctor to remove your tumor. They don't let airplanes, when they crash, the pilots or the people who crash the airplane, that airliner is not the one who reviews the black box. And so I think those right. answers have to come now. That's not a question for later. And I think one of the learnings for the U.S., I think there's a lot of learnings for the U.S., Tucker, but one of the learnings is if that establishment can get it wrong in Israel from a U.S. perspective, that could happen right here at home. And if anything, as an ally, one of the things that we need to wake up to is that we're vulnerable here in the United States to the same. In the context of brutal violence in the Middle East, both from Hamas and the Israeli army, Western journalists and politicians are trying to airbrush out the occupation as its ultimate cause. Speaking to Rachel Johnson on LBC, Mohammed Al-Kurd pushed back against that framing. We have seen a situation of lose-lose, which has been obtaining for far too long, for decades, really since the inception of the State of Israel. Let's start here. Let's start here. It's certainly not a lose-lose situation. There is one population that lives under a system which has been deemed by many, many global human rights organizations as a system of apartheid. It is not a win-win. There's a population that lives inside a cage without citizenship, without right to movement, without access to clean water, and there's a, and there's a population that enjoys its full rights. I mean, if, you, if, if your major concern is that they have some bits of anxiety and some bits of anxiety here and there when, when Hamas no, fires... I think you are minimizing, way, so you're minimizing the, exper the Israeli experience no, no, I in think the last you're six hours. I think you're minimizing... I think you're, when you compare an occupied population, a population that has been ethnically cleansed, a population that lives under a system of apartheid, to a population that is afraid of the population that is occupying, you are minimizing, not me. I mean, that was really well put, right? And it's important to say, look, it's it, it's perfectly normal and right, I think, you know, to have sympathy with people who are worried that their their loved ones might have um, been killed over the past 36 hours, right? I assume Rachel Johnson was talking about the wider anxiety that people feel. But that doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to the fact that for decades and decades and decades, people have had no freedom, no sovereignty, that uh, people are killed in Palestine with impunity all the time and the world doesn't sort of light up the Palestinian flag on public buildings. So this idea that, yeah, this is just, again, she was also putting forward this thing. It's, it's, it's too lose-lose. You know, it's, it's, it's hard for Israel, it's hard for Palestine. Why can't you just agree to get along? You know, it ignores the fact that this is uh, a relationship of occupy and occupied. It's not just there's two ethnic groups and they can't get along. It's there is a 56-year-long occupation of Palestine, right? Now, if you're a one-stater, you'll say there's a 70-year 
occupation of Palestine because you'll say Israel itself has no right to exist. I sit on the fence when it comes to this, um, but I think everyone agrees um, that the occupation of, of the West Bank is illegal, um, always has been, and it has been going on for more than 50 years. Um, of course, that framing isn't surprising when it comes from Rachel Johnson. She is the sister of Boris Johnson. Um, surely the BBC, though, bastion of neutrality, would do better. Um, that's not what Palestinian ambassador to the UK, Hussam Zomlut, found when he appeared on BBC News. You just condemned Israel for killing civilians, and you won't condemn Hamas for killing civilians. How many times you have interviewed Israeli officials, Louise? Hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. How many times Israel have committed war crimes right live on your own cameras? Do you start by asking them to condemn themselves? Have you? You don't. You don't. No, no, I'll answer that question. You don't. You know why I refuse to answer this question? Because I, I refuse the premise of it. Because at the very heart of it is misrepresentation of the whole thing. Because it's the Palestinians that are always expected to condemn themselves. I mean, come on, this is a political conflict. We have been denied our rights for a long time. So this is the wrong starting point. The right starting point is to focus on the root causes, is to try and get out of this extreme dark tunnel, as opposed to this business and how, by how, BBC how and the mainstream media for, for 75 years. You, get, you bring us here whenever there are Israelis who are killed. Did you bring me here when many Palestinians in the West Bank, more than 200 uh, over the last few months? Do you invite me when there is such Israeli provocations in Jerusalem and elsewhere? Because Israel, what Israelis have seen, which we started by saying tragic, the last 48 hours, the Palestinians see every day for the last 70, uh, 50, 50 years. You know the situation in Gaza, you've just described it. This is the biggest open air prison. Those people, 2 million, have been taken hostage by Israel for the last 16 years. So I'm saying this just to say, Louise, perhaps this is about time we abandon this, this rhetoric, very dangerous, this framework, and we start giving people the real ugly truth sometimes. That was for Sam Zomlot. Now, after giving that interview, he's spoken to the world transformed and he said that six of his family members have been killed in raids on Gaza. So, you know, just so awful to be in that situation. And it is the case that it, it, it is always representatives of the Palestinians who are asked to condemn things way more than representatives of the Israelis, even though the Israelis are the occupier. Let's go to one more clip. On, the, on his CNN show, host Fareed Zakaria conducted a long interview with Mustafa Barghouti. Um, he's leader of the Palestinian National Initiative. Now, Barghouti was allowed to put the Palestinian perspective for nearly 10 minutes, ending with this. We have lived all our lives under occupation. My father lived under occupation. My daughter is living under occupation. We want a time when we, the Palestinians, will be free. Hamas was not there 30 years ago or 40 years ago. But before that, PLO was described as terrorist. Any Palestinian who struggles for his rights or for freedom is described as terrorist. And the question here, do we have the right to struggle for freedom? Do we have the right to struggle for real democracy? Do we have the right to have normal democratic elections, which unfortunately Israel and the United States don't support? I think we are entitled to that. But the unfortunate thing, if we struggle in a military form, we are terrorists. If we struggle in a nonviolent way, we are described as violent. If we even resist with words, we are dis described as provocators. If you support Palestinian and you are a foreigner, they describe you as anti-Semite. And if you are a Jewish person, and there are many of those who support Palestinian cause, they call him self-hating Jew. This should end. It doesn't make sense. We should all have equal life. We should all have peace. We should all have justice. And we should all live in dignity. The main way to achieve that is to end occupation, end the system of apartheid that I am sure no Jewish person can be proud of. Time has come for that. And time has come for justice and freedom. If we achieve that, there will be no violence and nobody will be hurt. So that interview has been seen millions of times on, on, on Twitter. Now, I have to say, Ash, I found the media coverage of this, you know, it hasn't been balanced, but it's been more balanced than I've expected. And it's been a hell of a lot better than what we've been hearing from our politicians. I think there's a big difference as well here between people who are there, people who are in Palestine who have reported on the ground there. And then you've got sort of the, the commentators based in, in London. I saw Lise Doucette on the BBC who was sort of speaking. She's their international correspondent. And she was sort of saying, you know, she was she's speaking to people in Gaza or speaking to people in Palestine. I'm not precisely sure what part. Um, and she was saying, they're saying, we're completely desperate. What else can we do? 
right? And you often do have some journalists who have knowledge on the ground being quite open-minded in terms of what's going on here. But then you have sort of the politicians and you have the the comment editors and you have the people who do the headlines who are really, really strict by just saying, no, terrorism, good guys, bad guys. Um, but, you know, of course, the Palestinians who have sort of been giving interviews to mainstream media have, you know, a, a, as they have been in every time this this issue flares up in the past few years, have been doing a, a phenomenal job. I suppose I want your views on sort of how the media has been been covering this over the past three days. Well, I think the the simple fact of representing Palestinian voices in British and American media has changed an awful lot in the past 10, 15 years. I mean, once upon a time, you would just never hear from Palestinians, whereas now I think there is at least a bit of understanding amongst editors and producers that you need Palestinian voices to comment on these events the same way well, not the same way, because, of course, they're held to a completely different standard. But it would be a notable absence if you only had Israeli or pro-Israel voices. So I think there has been some efforts to, to you know, reach out and include some degree of Palestinian representation. But I was talking to Mohammed Al-Kurd about this on Downstream not that long ago. And one of the things that he said he felt intensely frustrated by is that he's always asked to do the exact same thing when he's asked to do media about Palestine. He's asked either to condemn violence or to prove that he's not anti-Semitic, or he's asked to sort of do this performative suffering. He described it as showing our bruises, you know, showing our bruises, showing how we suffer, sort of becoming a bit of like a spectacle of pain. And what's missing from that is the political struggle that's going on. You're only allowed to be a perfect victim of violence. And of course, a perfect victim never struggles, never resists, never fights back, never tries to change their circumstances from a position of subjection to one of parity. And I think that this is why, just reflecting on our earlier conversation about how should we as left-wing people, as people who are horrified by violence against civilians and recognize that the civilians who have suffered the most from this ongoing, shouldn't even say conflict, but ongoing illegal occupation has been the Palestinians. How do you how do you even begin to understand this? I think that this is where you also have to remember what the nature of people's struggles for freedom, what that's been like. If you Look at the armed wing of the ANC and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa to the activities of the FLN in Algeria when Algeria was under French colonization. There were things that were done that I don't think any of us would be comfortable with and would certainly be uh, against international law. Now, that's not to say well, because it happened in these struggles and these struggles won, it means that absolutely everything is morally justified. But that gives you an understanding about how you end up in an escalating cycle of violence, which is driven predominantly by the most powerful actor, i.e. the occupier, i.e. the apartheid state. And that's the kind of thing which Palestinians very rarely get the opportunity to say, or if they do, they're suddenly put back in that box of terrorist Hamas supporter, why won't you condemn? Because the best that they can hope for within this very limited media script is to be the perfect victim. As an, and as Mohammed el uh, you know, talked to me about it, that is, that's not a good place to be. It's not a powerful place to be. The U.S. is just as culpable as Israel for the atrocities committed in Gaza. The Israeli government dropped thousands of leaflets on Gaza, telling everyone who lives in the northern part of the Strip that they have 24 hours to evacuate to the southern part, and then bombed the people who were trying to evacuate. United Nations spokesman Stéphane Dujeric denounced the evacuation order, saying the UN considers it impossible for such a movement to take place without devastating humanitarian consequences. Many Palestinians have said they're going to stay where they are because they have nowhere safe to go, despite being told by Israel that they must leave if they want to save their lives. We're about to see the death and destruction get much, much worse in Gaza, and it's already very, very bad. As of this writing, the official death toll from the Israeli airstrikes in Gaza is speeding past 1900, 
a number which includes 614 children. The primary job of Israel apologists in the coming days will be producing and circulating narratives explaining why this self-evidently terrible thing is actually perfectly fine and reasonable. It's so incredibly obvious what we're looking at here. The only thing putting a wobble on people's perception is the immense amount of propaganda distortion the media is churning out on this issue, plus the fact that the demographics look a bit different from what history has conditioned people to watch out for. If there were two million Jewish people trapped by Christians in a giant concentration camp and placed under total siege, being told that half of them had 24 hours to relocate into the other half or be killed, nobody would have any confusion about what they were witnessing. And top-down commands are being issued within the U.S. government to support this massacre unconditionally. The Huffington Post reports that the State Department has been circulating internal emails telling staff to avoid calls for peace, instructing them to refrain from using phrases like de-escalation slash ceasefire, end to violence slash bloodshed, and restoring calm. Asked about progressive congressional members calling for a ceasefire, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said, We believe they are wrong, we believe they're repugnant, and we believe they're disgraceful. On the question of whether there are any potential Israeli actions that the White House would not tolerate, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters, I'm not here to draw red lines or issue warnings or give lectures to anybody. So to be perfectly clear for anyone who is confused, the U.S. government is fully behind this massacre and is just as culpable for everything that happens in Gaza as the Israeli government. These abuses are being perpetrated using U.S. weapons, U.S. funding, and U.S. consent. Washington could end this mass atrocity with a word, and instead they're fully aligning themselves behind it. Israel's crimes in Gaza are not meaningfully separate from the crimes of the U.S. war machine. This is just a continuation and extension of the violence and bloodshed the U.S. government has been inflicting around the world for generations. There's a clip of George W. Bush going around from a California event on Tuesday in which, for some bizarre, unfathomable reason, the former president was asked to provide his opinion on what Israel should do in response to the Hamas attack on October 7th. Bush said pretty much what you'd expect him to say. You're dealing with cold-blooded killers. Negotiating with killers is not an option. Only one side is guilty. The same book he's been reciting from since September 11th, 2001. What I find most interesting is, why is anyone asking the absolute worst person you could possibly ask about what should be done in response to such an attack? I mean, Bush is literally the very last person in the entire world who anyone should be asking what to do in this situation. Literally dead last, there are 8 billion people walking this earth right now who are infinitely more qualified to answer such questions than George W. Bush. The agendas Bush set out to advance in the wake of 9-11 plunged the Middle East into violence and chaos, which wound up killing millions and displacing tens of millions, all supposedly in response to an attack which killed 3,000. What is this man doing holding a microphone and publicly opining on what Israel should do in response to the Hamas attack? As we discussed earlier, 9-11 marked the beginning of some of the most deadly and catastrophic decisions ever made in U.S. history. Israel has demonstrated that it is eager to repeat these profoundly depraved decisions to the furthest extent possible, and the U.S. has demonstrated that it will fully support it in doing so. This is because the United States never learned any moral lessons from its warmongering after 9-11. If it had, George W. Bush would be sitting in a prison cell, and the U.S. wouldn't be backing a mass atrocity in Gaza. The U.S. centralized empire is the most murderous and tyrannical power structure on earth, of which Israel's criminality is just one component. And that's it for this edition of the Kent Garrett Podcast. I'm Kent Garrett. You can find our podcast on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Our podcast will also stream on WIOXradio.org every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time.